Okay, I guess we'll get started now. I'd like to welcome everybody here this evening, and also our leaders. I know they're fairly busy schedules, so, uh, and our, our moderator, Craig Mackey, and uh, each, for tonight's debate, each leader will have three minutes opening statement, and the order will be determined by chance. The order will change so we, each round, so that each leader will have to answer in a different order. And a rebut, after all parties respond to each question, uh, they may have up to 30 seconds to rebut answers from other leaders. And uh, we'll have questions from the Fed board that are made up ahead of time to go on for the first hour and a half. And the last half hour, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can write them on a piece of paper at the back. And uh, we'll ask as many of them as we can. And all answer, unanswered questions will be sent to the party leaders. Uh, we'll make a copy up for each of them so that they'll, have, uh, they'll know all the concerns that we're here tonight. Uh, and the times will be monitored closely. We have a timekeeper here. Uh, and each leader will have a one minute wrap up at the end of the evening. So we want to finish right around nine o'clock. So uh, we'll give the, each leader a minute to wrap up then. And we'd like to also ask everybody to uh, show the same respect as we had in the past to our leaders and that there's no heckling or any kind of stuff like that taking place. We know there won't be anyway, but uh, we'd just like to, to mention that. And, uh, so I'll turn it over now to Craig Mackey, and I'd like to thank him for uh, putting that the joint event for us, Craig. Thanks, Carl. Thank Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think everybody knows everybody here, but let's introduce the party leaders in alphabetical order if we could. And on the far right from the, the Island Party, Billy Can. Uh, next to him with the Progressive Conservative Party, Olive Crane. From the Liberal Party, Prince Edward Island, it's uh, Premier Robert Giz. Leader of the Green Party, Sharon Lapchuk. And the leader of the New Democratic Party from Prince Edward Island, James Ron. And what we'll do to get things going, do you want to pick? one of these. All right. So we'll go in alphabetical order, but it will start with uh, uh, Sharon Labchuk will be the first one to answer the first question, and then we'll just rotate through, and each time I'll, I'll shift the cards in my hand so that you have a chance. I was warned, uh, I asked what I should wear tonight, and uh, Carl said, well, you can wear a tie. And on the way to, out the door, he goes, but not a red one. Not a blue one, and not an orange one, and not a green one. Do you know how much trouble I had finding a tie that didn't fit all the green. It's sort of green. It's kind of yellow. Good luck to everybody tonight, and let's have, uh, have a good discussion. Our first question, one in every three seniors in our province is retiring in poverty. The labor movement has a plan for retirement security for all Canadians. What will your government do to advocate for an increase in the CPP, the Canada Pension Plan, so that all seniors can retire? Oh, sorry. Here, I'm getting ahead of it. I want to get right into it. Opening statement, three minutes from each, and Sharon, you will leave, and then we'll rotate. And just, just so you notice, there's a yellow card which will give you 30-second warning, and when the red card goes up, you're done. All right? Sorry about that. Please proceed. Okay. Well, you know, I was looking over your website and all the various um, uh, submissions you've made to government and, and uh, who's on your side. Just all the stuff I could to get myself up to speed on some of the things that you've been advocating for over the years because there's a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought tonight, man, this is going to be a pretty boring debate for you guys because I kept looking through it. Okay, that's in our poll. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we got that too. I mean, I could not find a single... Um, issue in any of the material I read on your website that wasn't in either our provincial policy book or in our federal policy book uh, that was complete 100% agreement on everything really. I mean I've done some debates where um, with industry groups where there have been things that we couldn't possibly agree on but honestly everything I saw in, in all your materials we agree with. The only thing that and, and probably there just wasn't room to spell this part out but I really liked what you had in the local procurement um, part of your uh, um, literature 
And that's something that the Green Party has had for, for a long time, both federally and provincially, in our policy book, too. And in fact, the Green Party and PEI has this, has this vision for PEI, at least rural PEI, of a revitalized rural PEI where it's not being depopulated the way it is now with, with these big monoculture farms that don't hire workers, but it's repopulated with, with this new generation of young people who are absolutely hungering to grow food. And along with that, comes small processing facilities to hire other people to work in. And along with that comes an increase in a different kind of tourism, um, a food-based tourism based on artisan foods and, and more culture and more arts, and, uh, and, and a lot more jobs in, in rural PEI. But the, the procurement thing really interested me because that ties in with the 100% organic island that we promote in that we are advocating for all hospitals, schools, jails, any government facility at all, to purchase local food, and I mean local organic food, not pesticide sprayed stuff, and we certainly have incentives to help transition those over to organic. And we, we would like to see actually kitchens in every single school. I grew up in a kind of a school, and went to schools that had kitchens in the schools, where the food wasn't shipped in from Nova Scotia, frozen and reheated. It was local food, people in the kitchen who live in the community with jobs making that food, and, uh, and the same in every government facility across PEI. Local food purchase, <coughs> local people there to cook it from scratch, local people to serve it, and local people to eat it. And I think I'm out of time, am I? No. What does that look hurt for? <laughs> okay, so just to sum up, I love, I love everything I saw in, in all the literature I read, um, and I really couldn't find anything that we could not support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, next opening statement from Mr. Roy. Thank you. As a leader of the New Democratic Party of PEI, I'm especially pleased to be participating in this leaders debate sponsored by the PEI Federation of Labor. After all, the uh, Canadian Labor Movement uh, was one of the two parents involved in the birth of the New Democratic Party almost exactly 50 years ago. The other being the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. In some ways, this is a bit like coming home. In fact, it's this family connection that perhaps distinguishes us most as compared to the other political parties. Sure, the NDP and the labor movement have had their family feuds from time to time, but at the end of the day, we know that we can sit around the kitchen table and have some real meaningful discussions um, and heart-to-heart -heart talks. And when something has to be done that's important to working people, we'll be standing side to side and shoulder to shoulder with you. Unfortunately, with the other political parties, and in particular the liberal and conservative parties, if you want to talk to them, it's as if union members and representatives are those annoying, unwelcomed neighbors. Sure, you're allowed to come in for a short visit, but only when it's convenient. And then it's like you're ushered into one of those living rooms where everything is wrapped up and the protective coverings are on and you don't dare sit down on the furniture. <laughs> That's presuming that they'll even talk to you or answer any questions. And if you don't believe me, just talk to someone who's worked for the Department of Labor, or, excuse me, I mean the Division of Labor. Correct me, I'm sorry. That should be the Division of Labor and Industrial Relations and Seniors. You know the desk in the corner somewhere near the broom closet uh, in an obscure government office. So just ask someone who's worked on labor issues for a liberal or conservative government in Prince Edward Island. And if they're able to speak freely without fear of repercussion, they'll tell you that there's more interaction with business owners and managers than there is with union members and their representatives. Well, brothers and sisters, I can assure you that it won't be that way under an NDP government. And I can assure you that despite some media commentators and spin doctors for the other parties, whatever they may say, there will be an NDP government here on Prince Edward Island. Remember when the NDP was born some 50 odd years ago? These same people, or their Jurassic predecessors, said the NDP will never survive. And if it does, it will never form a government in Canada. 
They said it in Saskatchewan, in British Columbia, in Manitoba, in Yukon. That's it. Yes, Mr. Roger, time's up. Well, there we are. Thank you. I'd like to move now to <laughs> Mr. Ken, you're next. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for letting us come here tonight. You're a very important part of the government of PEI. Uh, without you people, especially for a party like the Allen Party, we would never get very far if we ever elected members or if we ever go into uh, get in the position to uh, to uh, run government. Uh, and we would need good people like the uh, <coughs> the public employees of Prince Edward Island to help us. Uh, and I, you know, there's a lot of smart people in here. And uh, what we plan on doing in a lot of instances is, is we will glean from you people <coughs> the information that we need to run this province. Uh, one thing that we will do is we will have, uh, we will bring in whistleblower legislation for uh, public sector employees so that there will be no record retaliation, no shifting of employees around from here to there because they're trying to do the right thing. If they see something done that's not in, in, in you know, that's not right, you can come to us, you can tell us, and you have all confidence that it will be kept in strict confidence and we will do what needs to be done to make things right. Um, and as far, you know, we're talking about PMP here all over the place the last couple of days. Those people should be treated with respect. You know, they come in and they, they, whether they blew the whistle, whether they see something that was wrong, they went, <clears throat> and they're not crazy. There's nothing wrong with those people. They just see, they want things done the way they're supposed to be done. They want things, they want the right thing done for PEI. And if the Donald Party is elected, we will do the right thing for PEI. And with your help, we can do that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Crane. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, shop stewards, union presidents, union members, and uh, fellow Islanders. I'd like to begin by thanking the Federation of Labor for their invitation to participate here tonight. And I also want to uh, take the time to recognize all party leaders. You know, for all of us, it's been an extremely busy, uh, but a very rewarding couple of weeks. I've been very clear from the beginning, this election has been and continues to be a hard-fought election. But what matters, matters most is what Islanders are saying on the doorsteps. I believe Islanders are calling for change, for a better, more prosperous island. And what we've been hearing clearly from East Point to North Cape is that the Progressive Conservative Party can offer this. will deliver an open, honest, transparent government, a government that can be trusted. This election is about ideas. It's about giving Islanders an opportunity to offer their ideas, their views and concerns. It's about putting an emphasis back on people rather than politics. An election that's focused on providing Islanders with an alternative to the Liberal administration. A progressive conservative government will restore the public's trust back in government. We will uh, be a government uh, for Islanders because Islanders certainly deserve better. Our government will re-establish an open-door policy with unions and look forward to constructive and respectful dialogue with all unions. Your Progressive Conservative Party has a vision for where the province can go. We need Islanders to be part of that vision, to stand up and to be heard, to take an active role in helping to shape our province now and into the future. Together we can achieve great things. We'll move this province forward and make PEI the best it can be. A PC government will be accountable, invest in family and communities. On October 3rd, Islanders will make a crucial decision. They will decide between this present administration that has been described as fiscally weak and has been less than honest with Islanders or a progressive conservative government that will not forget who it serves, the people of PEI. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker in our round of opening statements, Mr. Gibbs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Craig, and uh, thank you to uh, the Federation, of course, uh, for organizing uh, this evening. When we first had, had the privilege uh, of forming government uh, a little over four years ago, we wanted to make sure that our priorities were going to be in the areas of health care, education, social policies. And uh, I'm very proud of our record. 
Uh, I'll stand by it. Uh, I think if you look at what we've done in healthcare, uh, we've moved from about uh, 81 uh, family physicians up to about 96, 190 doctors overall to 218. Uh, in our uh, education system, uh, we were able to introduce full day kindergarten uh, into our public school system, which is one of the most probably significant investments uh, that has been made uh, in a long time in our public education system. Uh, we made more investments uh, in the Best Start uh, program, which helps out all island children uh, get, a best possible, get their best possible start in life. Uh, we revamped early childhood education. Uh, so now there's early learning centers all across the province. We made sure that there's decent wages uh, for our early childhood educators. Uh, and we're providing uh, the best possible opportunity uh, to all our islanders. Some of the areas where I've been proud of uh, over the last number of years were, of course, around uh, minimum wage. Uh, we've been able to increase that uh, on a regular basis. We are going to hit uh, $10 an hour. Uh, we've negotiated uh, in good faith uh, with our unions. Uh, one of the areas I'm probably the most proud of uh, was that we ended the clawback of the National Child Benefit. That was clawed back uh, for a period of time and now that's putting $750,000 additional in the year, uh, a year in the pockets uh, of low-income islanders uh, who, who need it the most. Uh, we introduced pension legislation, uh, which is now uh, out for consultation. Uh, and one of the areas that I probably paid the biggest price uh, within my own party, uh, but it's something that I'm willing to stand by, is we resisted the urge, like every previous government, liberal or conservative, uh, in the province of Prince Edward Island, uh, where we did not fire 800 to 1,000 people uh, when we first got elected. And I can let everyone know. And, that happened, people came in, they tore up their Liberal membership cards, they didn't like it, but we were a government that wanted to deliver uh, that change. Uh, I believe I've had a, a great relationship uh, with our union leaders. While we don't agree all the time, um, that's part of life. Uh, I don't agree with the business community or the Chamber of Commerce all the time. I don't agree with the federal government all the time. I don't agree with other provinces all the time. And I don't think the labor unions expect me us to agree all the time. But we've had uh, a good working uh, relationship, and I hope to be able to continue all, along uh, down those lines. Our party is about uniting, not dividing, uh, and we want to have the privilege of serving Islanders for another four years. Thank you very much. There are a series of six questions that have been written up by the uh, Federation of Labor, and uh, we will start to go through these. I'd just like to do one little bit of housekeeping to remind people if they could to either turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate so that they don't interrupt the proceedings tonight. I forgot to mention that off the top. And I'll remind the leaders to stay close to your microphone so everybody in the room will be able to hear you. Now, the first question that I already started, but we'll come back to right now, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll move the order over by one, uh, one leader. So the first question is, one in every three seniors in our province is retiring in poverty. The labor movement has a plan for retirement security for all Canadians. What will your government do to advocate for an increase in the CPP, the Canada Pension Plan, so that all seniors can retire in dignity? Mr. Rod, you're first. Well, certainly we, uh, we don't agree with the federal government that this should be a voluntary uh, increase. We believe that it should be uh, done. Um, uh, mandatorily and uh, that everyone has the opportunity of, uh, of utilizing uh, a reasonable uh, Canada Pension Plan. Um, a lot of our seniors are <coughs> retiring without adequate uh, CPP and uh, we believe that uh, the CPP should presently be doubled over the next uh, short term between the three and five years. So. Uh, that would be one way in which our, our seniors could uh, retire in dignity. Um, I don't have anything further to say at that at, at this point. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rod. Mr. Ken, you're next. Thank you. Uh, the own party has. Uh, we will add support to the CCP or an alternative to that to boost up seniors who are in the poverty level. Um, the previous governments for years have not addressed that and we believe that you know there are seniors out there who especially during the winter months when they have to pay a lot of oil costs, heating costs, they have to pay a lot on uh, electric costs you know they're struggling <coughs> in those months to pay bills, to buy medicine prescriptions and to keep food on the table 
So for us, we think there's, it, we would give them a, a rebate, or an, a, we would give them some monies for, uh, to boost their, uh, their, their heating cost and their electric cost. It's not gonna cost a lot. I mean, we've wasted a lot of money in this property in the last four and a half years, I know that, because I've looked down around my area, and then there's big buildings all over the place with no one in them, so and millions and millions of dollars have been wasted. Let's give it to the seniors, okay? Uh, those people paid, just like you have, you know, and worked and, and paid taxes all their lives, you know, and they shouldn't have to freeze in the dark out in rural PEI, and we will, if we're elected, or we have elected MLAs, in this power, we will fight hard for seniors to make sure they got prescription drugs, make sure they got <coughs> heat, to not have to worry about uh, food, putting food on the table, and uh, make sure they, you know, they, they've got what they deserve. They paid, us, you know, all through, and now I think we need to pay. It's time to pay back to them instead of giving uh, big companies and, and uh, wasting a lot of money. We do want to cut back on those things and, and give it to our owners. Owners first. Thank you, Mr. Ken. Ms. Green. Thank you. You know, I really believe we have to focus on expanding our jobs across PEI. Um, as we know, the present administration had put a lot of focus on the prosperity plan, but it really left out so many people. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I think it's important to put some fairness back in the system. We still have a senior compensation package in the province that provides for every one pension year worked, uh, two full pension years uh, for senior government employees and I don't think that's fair. Directly for seniors, uh, our progressive conservative <coughs> government will increase the provincial personal exemption to $7,900, and we're also going to uh, have a voluntary tax credit of $500 for seniors who volunteer with a charitable or athletic or not-for-profit organization. And finally, um, we will continue to work um, with the federal government on advocating for um, seniors. Thank you, Ms. Crane. Mr. Giz? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, the Labour leaders uh, in the room uh, would know, we were probably one of the first supporters of the expansion of uh, the CPP. Uh, in fact, our uh, Minister of Finance, Wes Sheridan, uh, was helping uh, leading the charge. And around the first minister's table, you can go and ask the other NDP premiers. Uh, it was really myself, uh, Daryl Dexter, and Greg Selinger uh, who were leading the charge. We basically had everybody on side. Um, I don't want to get into politics in other provinces, but there was good news out of Alberta uh, on, the, on the weekend for, I'm sure, anybody who follows that uh, in terms of who was fighting the battle against CPP uh, enhancements. Unfortunately, even Flaherty seemed to be on side with it for a while, and it seemed to be moving into the right direction. I think when it reached PMO, um, something happened. Uh, it didn't seem to be a priority. I'm not sure why. I thought it was a very good idea. Uh, this is about ensuring that we'll protect seniors into the future. Uh, and I think that it's something that, uh, for me, uh, is very important. Um, one of the other areas that, uh, just to demonstrate where I think, and I didn't get a chance to mention this uh, in my opening, where we could make a difference here provincially, and, and we have, and one of the things I'm the most proud of, was that as a provincial government, we want to help take care of our youth as well. Uh, and probably one of the proudest things I've announced so far, bar none, in the campaign has been the fact that as a provincial government, we're actually going to contribute uh, to low-income islanders' families who have children, and we're going to contribute their portion of the RESP so that we can maximize those federal dollars. And to me, that's about making sure that our young children can get the best possible start in life. We'll push for this CPP uh, with uh, the federal government, and it's unfortunate that it got derailed because there's a Conservative government in power in Ottawa. Thank you. Ms. Lepcho. Um, I note that in your uh, literature you're advocating for doubling of the CPP, and that's also what we at the federal level and the Green Party advocate for as well. And it's in our federal platform. So we would certainly work with a uh, federal Green government or any government at all to advocate for that. Um, in terms of other measures for seniors, we are advocating um, no income tax on low incomes, below the low income cutoff rate, which is about $20,000, I think, right now. And um, also working towards a guaranteed livable income. Now, this is going to require uh, uh, cooperation with the federal government and other provinces as well. And if you've not heard of guaranteed livable income, it's, it's something that has been, um, it's been, 
it's been studied, it's been advocated, and it's, and it's widely seen as a good alternative to the kinds of shame-based um, social services that we, we have now where you've, well, you know what you have to do to get the money. So it would provide a, a basic income for all Canadians, no matter um, what your age, and no clawback until after a certain point. So it, it guarantees a, a, live, a guaranteed livable income. And um, as someone who is, as I hate to admit it, approaching seniorhood myself, I can't <laughs> imagine how that's happening, but uh, I happen to be one of those people who I don't have much in the way of retirement. You know, I worked as an activist and you know, there's no funding for activists much and there's no retirement savings plans for activists. So I really relate to this particular issue and it's near and dear to my heart in that there are a lot of people just like me who are going into that stage of their lives with very little to go on and that is something that um, we would certainly work very hard for in this province to alleviate. Good, thank you. Uh, we're now going to give uh, each of the leaders up uh, to 30 seconds for if there's any rebuttal that they would like to make. So we haven't rehearsed this part, but if you can do a 10 second warning with the yellow, that would be good. And we'll uh, return to Mr. Rod, you can start the rebuttal series. Okay, well, uh, I, I think also that uh, in answering these questions, one doesn't have to answer the question totally, you just have to go on with your pla particular platform. So I'm going to uh, suggest that uh, we uh, would uh, uh, cover the Pensions uh, Benefits Act that both the Liberals and the Conservatives have failed to put into legislation uh, and that would give uh, seniors that added protection so that when, when uh, organizations go out of business, the, potential, the pensions are protected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rod. Mr. Kent? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think Mr. Rod said that with the, with the pensions, uh, we have to look very closely at how the pensions are, are the uh, are being looked after, you know, that money, uh, people pay into that, and we have to be very careful about, you know, we've seen in 2007, September, October 2007, what can happen to pension funds. Uh, so we have to be really careful that some of us, I'm sure, we need to put into a uh, <coughs> an interest-bearing account rather than have it all out there on the stock markets and those types of things. So we'll look into those things. Thank you very much. Ms. Craig. Thank you. In 2007, the Liberal administration promised that they were going to increase the provincial personal exemption by $500, which would directly impact on seniors. They failed to do that. Uh, I think that this is really important, and this helps to increase um, how much money seniors are able to keep, especially when they are retired. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Mr. Kiss. Uh, thank you very much. We've made uh, our focus uh, over the last uh, number of years uh, on seniors uh, very well. Uh, whether or not it's increase in home care funding, uh, which is extremely important, uh, building new manors uh, across our province, uh, which uh, uh, were long overdue uh, to be replaced, uh, more social housing uh, that is helping out uh, our seniors as well. And uh, if we have the uh, privilege to be reelected, we'll make sure seniors remain a priority. Thank you very much. And Ms. Um The Greens use a tax system a lot to encourage what's good and discourage what's bad for the environment, for society, for the economy. And certainly there's a lot of scope within our tax system to provide rebates and tax breaks to, um, to things like home heating oil without giving a, 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 we totally disagree with giving blanket tax um, breaks to everyone, but certainly tax breaks to people in various income levels could help. Thank you very much. The second question, Public services are important to our communities and keep our communities vibrant and healthy. We know that contact, contracting out costs more and reduces the services provided. What will your government do to protect all public services and public sector jobs to ensure a healthy Prince Edward Island? And we'll start with Mr. Kent. Thank you. First of all, uh, we're completely against P3s. We think that the cost is escalated in the long run, uh, you know, those people who, I, I, I have uh, properties myself, I rent in Montague, and, you know, I have to make a profit, you know. If long as government breaks even, we're okay. We don't have to make huge profits for those things, so that's one thing we will not be doing is to implement any type of hate, or PS, P3s, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, it's just, it's too costly, you know, it's been done in other places, and we know it don't, doesn't work. 
Uh, it works, it, but not for the people of PVI, not the taxpayer. It works for for large corporations. We make huge uh, <coughs> profits from them. So that's one thing that we're dead against. And I guess that's all. Thank you, Ms. Crane. Thank you. Uh, government's role is certainly to provide public services to their best of ability and to provide those programs and services on an equal and fair basis across PEI. Our government would certainly recognize and support collective bargaining principles and work with the unions. Um, I think the other part is uh, it's important to have an open door policy to have discussions and um, I guess finally, there's two areas that the present administration are using towards uh, reducing their debt that I'd be very cautious about. One is vacancy management, uh, and then the other is uh, regional procurement, because I think both of them can defeat the pur purpose of saving money if it's not done right, and at the same time can cause um, public sector job loss. Thank you. Mr. Giss? Uh, thank you very much. Well, obviously, with uh uh, vacant management positions. Uh, it's not going to be frontline services uh, in healthcare. Uh, it's going to be looking to see where there's jobs uh, that are currently there that are no longer needed, uh, whether or not uh, because of changing technologies, because of changing programs, uh, and we're going to make sure we do it in a way where no one loses their job. We'll do it in a way where someone's retiring, then we'll look at it. I think that that's the fair and compassionate way. Uh, you can see a, a conservative government uh, in uh, Ottawa right now that doesn't operate like that. Uh, we see what's happening in Montague, Prince Edward Island, where they're pulling jobs uh, out of there. And uh, one of the things that I'll do to maintain is from a provincial government perspective, we'll keep make sure that our public service is there and it's strong. My fear is around where the federal government's going. We see what's happening in Montague right now with service jobs. We don't know what's going to happen uh, with DVA, with the tax center, and I'm going to make sure that uh, uh, I stand up for Islanders to protect any jobs in this province. Thank you. Ms. Lepcher? Um, well, we're with you. We're against P3. I participated in a number of new news conferences with unions over the years opposing P3. Um, absolutely. I mentioned a little earlier the local procurement policy. I think that holds huge scope for um, protecting um, jobs and for, uh, in fact, increasing the number of jobs in the public sector. I mentioned the, the um, kitchens in every school. I mean, that accomplishes so many things at the same time. It creates employment. People in the community can have jobs preparing and serving the foods. And, um, and it, and it improves the children's health. I mean, it's, it's a win-win situation. It creates jobs at all levels. The people who have to grow the food, the people who cook it and serve it, and the kids win. So I think local procurement has a lot of scope um, for opening new food processing plants, I mean, probably pro uh, uh, plants in other areas too, like renewable energy. There's a lot of scope in PEI for purchasing local. Um, it's said that if uh, if the bridge is ever out for three days in the winter, I think there was an announcement like that this winter, we're out of food in three days around here. So we need to look at more resilient um, economies, and resilient economies are local economies. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Rob. Thank you. Um, certainly a strong public service uh, is uh, essential for a strong economy here in PEI. And in order to uh, have a strong public service, we have to eliminate the patronage that uh, both liberal and conservative governments have exercised over, the, over their tenures as governments. Um, to, uh, and that patronage uh, serves to favor uh, the friends of government, the corporations and individuals. Um, by hiring more uh, public servants uh, in uh, health care, uh, by providing uh, measures, uh, as has been mentioned, by uh, local procurement. Um, this will help to uh, revitalize our rural communities. It will help to revitalize our economy. And uh, when you have, uh, uh, for example, um, farmers who are unable to supply to institutions, uh, whether they be educational or health institutions, uh, hospitals in particular, um, and uh, those procurements that are coming in from off island, you can see where uh, there is a, law, a drain off of, or rather out of the economy. 
So it's, uh, it, it's incumbent on a government to have a strong public service, and uh, a new democratic government would work in tandem with, uh, with the unions to uh, see uh, how we could enhance those measures. Thank you. Thank you. And rebuttal now, 30 seconds each. Mr. Kent. Uh, Mr. Giz talked about the, uh, the job loss in Montague, and uh, I think you're, you're seeing an effect of meddling in federal politics during an election. Uh, Oh, down there, you know, close and plant and sort of, we lost 300 jobs. We already had 500 lost, or 200 lost in, in North Lake. We've had over 1,000 lost there since uh, <coughs> 2007. But, uh, you know, we do things perhaps that we shouldn't do, and then things come back to roost. So I Thank think that's what's happening Thank you, down Mr. there. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Ms. Craig? Thank you. Right now, the provincial budget's about $1.6 billion, and under this administration, they've increased under professional and contract services and also consultant services, and this is where we get into not unionized people. From 11% up to 12.6% of the $1.6 billion budget that the law decision. And that has to be addressed before anybody starts looking at the services uh, that are done by true public servants. Thank you, Mr. Giz. Thank you very much. It's not always easy being in government. Uh, plain and simple, uh, I find it a little ironic, uh, some of the uh, comments I'm hearing, because you hear allowing close, uh, allowing fish plants to close down, but at the same time you hear you're not going to give any money to outside corporations. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is nobody liked seeing Ocean Choice close down, but at the same time they were asking for 5 to 15 million with no guarantees that they were going to remain open. Uh, my question is, you know, what else could you do? Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Ms. Lapchuk? Um, a Green Party government would have better oversight on where taxpayers' dollars were spent in terms of investments in, in business. We've seen a lot of failures and a lot of, um, a lot of poor choices, which ultimately leads to less money being available for other areas that might be good investments like renewable energy. Thank you, and Mr. Rod. Um, from a uh, public-funded uh, health care system, uh, um, we, we intend to uh, continue that, that uh, there will be no privatization to occur. And uh, with regards to ocean choice, uh, the Premier and the government had a choice, no pun intended, to keep the uh, processing uh, equipment in the plant rather than having it trucked out by ocean choice or uh, to New Brunswick. It was very unfortunate for the workers of the community. Thank you, Mr. Roddick. Thank you. Well, we'll continue with the subject of jobs in our next question. Prince Edward Island has seen closures in fish plants and federal government job losses. We suffer from a high rate of unemployment. What will your government do to stimulate our economy and create meaningful job opportunities for all islanders, especially for our youth, in order to stem the flow of out-migration and create a healthy economy. And starting off this round, Ms. Crane. Sure. I think um, our decision to decrease the PST from 10% down to 9% in the first 120 days of our mandate and then down to 8% um, during the whole uh, mandate is going to put some disposable income into Islanders' hands. In addition to that, it's also going to impact on small to medium-sized businesses which is the backbone of the economy of PEI, and they can use that money to reinvest. The other part is I think it's important, especially in the area of youth, uh, many of our youth uh, are dealing with addiction issues, and we are committed to having an addiction facility here in the province. Um, the final part is we had a tremendous opportunity as a province uh, when the government had the provincial nominee program, and through mismanagement, over $400 million uh, came into the province, no one knows where it went, and the bottom line is that was such a missed opportunity for the people, especially people, uh, immigrants that had good market connections, etc. And, uh, you know, that's a whole area that, uh, again, the final part is uh, this administration did two economic impact studies and failed to release either one of, of them. So, you know, there's opportunities there. It's about people, relationships, and work, and respect. Thank you very much. Mr. Gibbs. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, it's been difficult uh, over the last three years. We went through probably worldwide wide one of the worst recessions uh, since uh, the Great Depression. Prince Edward Island did reasonably well compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, you know, 
know, we had one year where we shrunk by 0.1%, and the other years we either maintained where we were at or we grew a little bit. Uh, some of the main contributors to that uh, was the stimulus package that we did introduce. Traditionally speaking, we usually spend about $70 million a year on infrastructure projects. We raised that up over a three-year period to about $130 uh, million. But I think in the long term, as we look at lowering down our unemployment, finding more opportunities for our young people, it's about a couple of different things. One, diversifying our economy. Uh, we're still very fortunate that our three largest industries are agriculture, fisheries, and tourism. We want to see those industries thrive in our province, but it's important to look for new industries, aerospace, bioscience, IT, renewable energy are some great opportunities. But how, what is the world looking for? What are uh, people that want to create employment, they're looking for the best possible educated workforce. Barack Obama recently said, those areas of the world that out-educate us today will out-compete us in the future. And I want to make sure that as a government, if we have the privilege to continue, the last four years, I'm very proud of our record on education, but I think there's more to be done. And if you look at the investments that we've made around post-secondary education with the George Coles Bursary, which is $2,000 for any islander wanting to attend uh, UPEI, Holland College, or La Societe Educative, uh, that we've seen some of the highest enrollments. We now want to put a George Coles Bursary on the fourth year to make it easier for our island students to graduate in the last year. And I think that's really what it's going to be about. There's no short-term fixes. It's about long-term diversifying our economy and concentrating on education. Merci. And we'll now move to Ms. Lacha. The more we depend on the global economy, or the more we're integrated with the, the global economy, <coughs> the more um, risk we uh, um, take in Prince Edward Island in terms of keeping our economy stable. So we are in the Green Party looking to create local economies. They are the most resilient kinds of economies. and. Um, one of the, uh, and it's time on PEI to, we talked about this at the tourism debate. Tourism seems to come up with sort of a, a brand or a vision for itself periodically. It may not be the greatest, but at least they're looking for something like that. As an island, as a whole, that's something we need to do. So that all sectors of the economy in Prince Edward Island are well integrated. And when they're well integrated, they work well together. <clears throat> right now, they don't work well together. Agriculture is at odds with tourism. Agriculture is, is, well, you know what agriculture is doing, it's destroying our, our rivers, it's polluting our water, it's polluting our air, we've got a bad rap all over Canada because of it, and tourism is suffering for it. Local business is suffering. I've had a number of calls from people over the, year, over the years who will call me and say, well, you know, I found your name on the internet and I read about this pesticide thing, has anything changed? I'm from Newfoundland, Not funny enough, I've had a number of calls from Newfoundland, thinking of moving to PEI, i got a small business, but I got kids, and well, I just don't know if I want to risk coming here because of the, the kids. So we need to integrate all <coughs> sectors of the economy, and that means for us moving to a 100% organic PEI, which will bring everything along with it. It will bring tourism along with it, it will bring education along with it, it will bring more small businesses, it will make us unique. We're not unique right now. We're trying to compete with commodities on a global market. We can't do that as a small province. But we can carve out a niche for ourselves and create more employment. Thank you, Ms. Lepcha. And uh, Mr. Rod. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I think that when, uh, when we look at our uh, economy here in Prince Edward Island, we have to look at the fact that the primary industries, the farming, fishing, and agriculture, uh, forestry are the main generators and even as bad as agriculture is in this province it is still the economic generator for the economy. Now uh, while I concur with uh, Ms. Labchuk here that uh, we should be moving towards a, uh, an organic province, um, if we were also to add uh, the fact that we were GMO free, genetically modified free, we would have the world at our doorstep and why would that be? Well, we're very unique in uh, our particular province and our situation in North America. Uh, we have a, we're an island and we're isolated and therefore we can do lots of things here on PEI that would be of benefit to the rest of the world. Um, our youth need meaningful jobs. They need a, 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 an adequate income. They need a livable income. And how are they going to get it? Are they going to get it? Are they going to uh, continue their education and come back to uh, ten dollar an hour minimum wage, or will they be leaving Prince Edward Island and uh, 
uh, we'll continue the brain drain. Uh, Prince Edward Island has a lot of things that are unique, and if we could brand ourselves as being an island that was uh, in, uh, looking after the environment, uh, that, we ha that we consider and respect labor, that we have an environmental issues that we are taking into account and that we are GMO free, and that we are producing healthy, nutritious food. And all of the uh, services that would be provided within that uh, complex uh, economy would, uh, would be seen by the rest of the world as being very genuine and a very sellable thing within the global economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rahm. And Mr. Kent. Thank you. I agree with Mr. Giz. Education is very important to uh, get ahead of the curve. Uh, but the Island Party will not be in the business of exporting the best and brightest people that we have at a PDI. Uh, we know fishing, farming, and tourism are the backbone of this problem. <clears throat> and we want young business people here. Uh, the polar food, ocean choice, tobacco was a mess. Everybody knows that. I mentioned that the last election with the Mr. Giz. Nothing's been done for four and a half years on that. I believe we need smaller plants. The one in storage is much too big, but the people need work, needed work and they should have got work. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the uh, windmills, I believe, is another thing that's very good for, especially government run operations where we're paying high heating and electrical costs. Uh, these small plants, smaller plants than the ones we have now, big uh, corporate plants don't really work with PEI because one goes down and they're done. The industry, your fishing industry, you know, it's over. Yeah. Uh, but I believe smaller plants are, are, are ideal for a place like this. They can be spread around. If something happens one, the rest will pick up the slack. Um, you know, it's also good for, for a windmill for a hospital. It's another thing that's, that's uh, I believe, would be, would it, it, anywhere you can make a savings, you know. Uh, <clears throat> We'll uh, encourage new businesses and small businesses to, to, uh, to come and see an island party government for startup money. Uh, you know, uh, those are the young entrepreneurs, I believe, are the backbone of an economy. And if we don't foster <coughs> the younger people here, uh, you know, we're not going to have much of an economy. The economy out west is flourishing because a lot of our people are out there working. And it's a credit to them. They're here, pay, they come and contribute to the American economy and our tax base. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now 30 seconds each for a rebuttal. Ms. Crane, you lead off. Thank you. Right now we have what's called the Labour Market Agreement uh, that is, um, provides dollars to the provincial government to provide correction, training and support around jobs. And I think that that uh, has to have some balance put back in it. For example, right now in the tourism sector there's about 15,000 jobs. They get $100,000 from uh, uh, government to tourism association. I think it's important to invest in our new sectors, but also in our creative sector. And Thank you, Ms. Crank. Mr. Giz? Thank you. Uh, well, the decision around <coughs> Ocean Choice uh, was a difficult one, and just so everyone knows, uh, the government did not have first right on the plant, uh, and it was uh, quite unfortunate, but it goes back to the last deal. But what I am proud of is myself and Alan Campbell went down there the day after we worked with the union. Uh, to bring in Skills PEI to make sure that every one of the people in people working at that plant would have the opportunity to find employment, and it's gone exceptionally well because we worked with the union. Thank you, Ms. Lecture. The fossil fuel age is drawing to a close. We all know that fossil fuel is becoming more expensive, more precious every single day. The shift to a low carbon economy is one of the biggest and most important shifts in the economies right around the world and we need to get on to it and start capitalizing on the opportunities there. Thank you. Mr. Rod? Uh, thank you. Just going back to uh, the, what the Premier said about Ocean Choice, why wasn't it an, an option to have the community involved? The town of Surrey, the fishers and the workers. Why couldn't a cooperative model be presented there and, uh, and deal with the uh, whether you have the first right or not, that plant and it owed taxpayers of PEI over $7 million. Why wasn't it an option to have that plant restored and put in the hands of the workers and the fishers? Thank you, and finally, Mr. Kent. Thank you. I'm, I guess I'll stay on the same theme of Ocean Choice at Polar Foods. Uh, when Polar Foods was alive, the fishermen wanted that option, but I'm not going to blame Olive or blame her predecessor, Pat Bintz, on that, and it was turned down. Uh, and also, the Giz government, four and a half years, 
to, to do something about this thing. Nothing was done. Okay? So that's why you have 300 people in, in uh, Surrey this spring out of work. And those people were not happy. I talked to those people. And, you know, they pulled the rug out from underneath those people the last day. Okay, it's just you, very cool, I think. We're going to move from uh, jobs to the healthcare sector. Two questions in this. It's a, a double barrel. <coughs> First part is what will your government do to ensure a sustainable public health care system to reduce wait times for surgeries and other medical procedures? And secondarily, uh, secondly rather, how will your government train, recruit, and retain doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals without allowing a two-tiered health care system on Prince Edward Island? And we'll start with Mr. Gibbs. Thank you very much. Well, obviously, this is the number one issue facing uh, our province today. Uh, and I think every province, and as a country, and probably even as a world, uh, when it comes to health care, uh, it's something that is extremely important. What I can say is, with regards to wait times, we've been able to reduce down a lot of wait times uh, across the province, especially around uh, mammography uh, screening. Um, we are going to open up a fifth uh, OR uh, here in, uh, at, the, uh, at our main uh, hospital in Charlottetown. Uh, that should allow us to do an extra 1,200 surgeries uh, per year. Uh, we built a new school of nursing in collaboration with the University of Prince Edward Islands. We introduced an accelerated nursing program. We're now training nurse practitioner, practitioners right here in the province of Prince Edward Island. Uh, we've added more seats in medical schools than ever before. Um, we now are going to have return of service, so our doctors that fill into those seats have to come back here and practice for five years anywhere in Prince Edward Island. We were the first government after we were told was impossible to do to introduce a residency program uh, here in the province of Prince Edward Island, which allows our young doctors to come and train here for the last two years. We've actually signed out of last year, out of the five, three or four of them have already agreed to come and stay on. Uh, for another year in practice right here in the province of Prince Edward Island. When we first got elected to government in 2007, the government of Prince Edward Island uh, spent below the national average on health care. Today, we spend above the national average. So that shows our commitment to health care compared to other provinces because all our revenues grew at a similar amount. We made it so much so that we were able to leapfrog uh, other provinces. And if we have the privilege of forming government again on October 3rd, Healthcare will remain our number one priority. Thank you, Mr. Giz. Ms. Lovechuk. Yeah, I don't think spending more money on health care than other provinces is any indication of a commitment to taking care of people. Taking care of people is preventing illness in the first place. And that's what the Green Party is all about, prevention of illness. We um, end up in the newspapers fairly often with surveys done of Canadians as people who exercise less than most other Canadians and our diets are worse than most other Canadians. On top of that, Environment Canada says that we are the most intensively sprayed province in all of Canada. And I happen to know for a fact that the majority of the chemicals that are in the air we breathe are classed by various agencies, including the United States Environmental Protection Agency, as cancer-causing. We've got high rates of cancer. They're also, I mean, every, every one of them, pesticides, is its own little health horror story. So we need to look at why we have ill health in this province and work to correct it. Not only because it saves us money, but also it's, it's um, a social justice um, aspect of it all. People should have the right to be healthy and not have to go through the anguish of, of their loved ones dying from cancer or their children with learning disabilities. And so you move on to the next step, which is um, doctor availability. Well, when you've got an unhealthy population and great demands on your doctors, of course you're going to need more doctor appointments. If we had a healthier population, we would have less need of people visiting doctors. And if we had community care centers, health care centers, which included a holistic grouping of doctors, midwives, practitioners, acupuncture, massage, all covered by health insurance, then there would be even less pressure on doctors who don't need, really need to see a lot of those people. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lockton. Mr. Roy. Well, uh, after listening to the premier, you'd think that everything was all well in the health care system here in PEI, what with all of the uh, uh, numbers uh, that he was uh, citing. However, there are problems with uh, health and PEI, and uh, one of the uh, big factors is health 
PEI that unappointed, uh, that appointed on elect, on uh, accountable uh, body uh, that provides the smoke and mirrors for the agenda of the uh, Liberal government. Um, as a government, we would eliminate health PEI and uh, put the responsibility back in the hands of the Minister of Health. Um, having said that, we also uh, believe that uh, measures from the Romano report could be implemented um, and carry on the uh, theme of preventative health care, such as uh, some of the uh, more uh, modern clinics like uh, Wellington and Rustico have, where their um, clinics are integrated with nutrition, uh, physiotherapy, uh, uh, preventative care. So uh, there are ways and means of, uh, of uh, going out into the communities of Prince Edward Island and providing services, health services, for the communities and for the residents, and uh, in ensuring that uh, uh, our public health care remains public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rod. Mr. Kent. Thank you. Health care is the largest budget in PEI in the government. Uh, and where's all the money being spent? You know, it's being spent on e-health, boards and commissions. Uh, and those are two, two things that we will eliminate. E-health and the boards and commissions will be gone in, in health care. We're going to put it back to the minister. The minister is responsible for health, or was anyway. Uh, and that's where we're going to put it if we're elected. We'll, we, we will lobby, whether it's with uh, other governments or what it is, to make sure that it goes back to help PEI, or to uh, the... Uh, the, the health minister. Uh, EMS vehicles. We need more of those. We believe we will add more of those vehicles to the <coughs> to the to the uh, to the fleet that they have, uh, and we will give EMS people the right to strike. They, they, it was taken away from them, uh, and the drug the, the drug coverage list will also be be something that we will review. <coughs> Also, the uh, for people or students that want to go to go and, and get uh, to become a doctor, there would be money there for them. Also, uh, we believe that you know it's kind of if you if you want to come back to PEI, well, there will be a certain amount of uh, your your your, and your student loan will be paid up by the uh, the province. We need doctors here. I think another thing, if we can cut the waste, we'll, we can afford doctors. Doctors will come here if they pay the right wage. You'll go any place. Most people go, people leave here to go out west all the time because the wages are a lot better. So a doctor will come into this problems if he's given the right pay. So will nurses, and nurses will stay here, and doctors will stay here if they're paid properly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dan. Ms. Craig? Thank you. You know, there's, uh, often we hear that there's 140,000 people on PEI, but we sometimes forget there's 1.2 million people that visit. So around our health, it's often issues around access and also retention issues. Uh, our party supports a 24-hour emergency service in Montague as well as Alberton. We also support bringing back the 51 frontline nursing positions that were eliminated. We also support having a retention strategy uh, and tied into that certainly having accountability back with the health minister. Uh, we do not support health being at an arm's length board, and uh, we would invest in the provincial catastrophic drug program. Again, if someone can't afford their medicines, it's actually causing more complications and causing more problems in the health system. Thank you, Ms. Green. And uh, rebuttal, 30 seconds, Mr. Hiss. Got to be quick. Okay, doctors pay. I'm married to a doctor. I can assure you our pay is comparable all across the country, and our doctors are very well paid here. Uh, Alberton ER, it's already open 24 hours a day. Health PEI, we sat here four years ago and I remember people were complaining, why is Treasury Board making decisions on staffing decisions? We went out, we consulted Islanders, there was a group of Islanders all across the province that made the decision on how to form Health PEI and it's a very good issue. We're going to get here, if Health PEI is disbanded, we'll be back here again in four years saying we need a Health PEI. Thank you Mr. Giz. Ms. Lepton. The basic right to clean air and clean water forms the very basis of health on PEI. Right now we have a situation where the air is contaminated with a cocktail of cancer-causing chemicals and our water is increasingly polluted. Every drop is polluted with nitrates and now our government has leased out large sections of the island and we're threatened with 
fracking and the contamination that results from that. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Uh, the New Democratic government would not allow a two-tier health care system on Prince Edward Island. And uh, with regards to a, a promise that uh, Premier Giz made uh, in the 2007 election regarding uh, the two hospitals up west, uh, O'Leary and Alberton, that he wouldn't close them, uh, guess what? Uh, the O'Leary Hospital is now a manor. And uh, uh, it seems that uh, uh, we do really need to address the needs in, of communities to ensure that uh, our residents are... Thank you, Mr. Rod. Thank you. Mr. Kent. Thank you. I also agree with Alf that uh, the, the hospital mining of the emergency room needs to be open there uh, 24 hours. It's uh, People I've talked to, and if you look in the uh, paper today, the Guardian, uh, it, we stated that in there, and we're also going to be opening the manor up. Uh, if we're elected, we'll, we'll make a manor there too. Uh, the, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cannon and Ms. Green. In terms of whistleblower legislation, I actually brought an expert down by the name of David Hutton that works with FAIR, and that's a group that tries to advocate um, protection for people that need to come forth in any situation in the work environment, and of course, uh, the President administration defeated that as well. And uh, finally, a huge issue around workers' compensation um, or some of the other acts is what happens to employees when they live and work in a different province. Uh, today, for example, I met with a gentleman whose workers' compensation is held in Brunswick, not the same benefits from here, and he does not have the resources to be able to advocate and get what he deserves back in New Brunswick. So those whole areas, uh, upon election, uh, we would be committed to work on. Thank you very much. Mr. Gibbs. Uh, thank you very much. Um, with regards to workers' compensation, obviously uh, there needs to be some improvements made there. But having said that, you know, I meet with the labor groups, they complain about workers' compensation. I meet with the workers' groups, they complain about workers' compensation. Nobody's happy with workers' compensation out there. There was some reviews done. Uh, we'll continue as a government to look at what is the fairest thing. And I can be honest with you, no one's happy on either side, whether it's labor uh, or the employers when it comes uh, to workers' compensation. Pension legislation, uh, it's been introduced. Uh, I believe it's out for consultation. Uh, right now, we hope to be able to uh, pass it uh, if we're given the privilege, uh, probably during the next uh, sitting or whenever the consultation uh, is done uh, after that. I'm not sure where the other parties stand on that. I read something in a document that maybe some of them are against it, but I'll, I'll allow them uh, to speak for that. Labor standards. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to have a fair system here in the province of Prince Edward Island. I'm not for uh, the two-tier minimum wage, if we had it been, it would have been introduced uh, already. Um, I met with uh, the uh, Restaurant Association and some of the employers that are asking for it, and I said, you guys are asking for it, the labor unions are dead against it. Right now, we have no plan on, on uh, introducing it. So I was honest with them. Of course, they come in and they then complain about the minimum wage. Uh, and I tell them, well, they asked for, I think, a delay of the minimum wage increases. I said no to that. I believe it's important that uh, our minimum wage uh, keeps increasing. So we'll continue to work on this. Thank you, Mr. Giz. And now the 30-second uh, round of rebuttals, led off by Ms. Lapchuk. Canadians are some of the most overworked people in the industrialized world. We work more hours, we work, we work more overtime, we get more stress, and uh, more health issues because of it. The Green Party would work to bring in um, an increased vacation, three weeks to four weeks, phased in. Oh, that's quick. <laughs> that's yellow. Well, it's yellow. Okay. Uh, be because in Europe, um, where countries have done this, and they have got four weeks there. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, certainly, uh, the discussion here has been around the uh, two-tiered um, wage, and it's still on the books, it's still on the, on the legislature. And whether the Premier says uh, he, uh, uh, the business community is saying that they would like to maintain that or enhance that or whatever, the, the simple fact is, if you're not in favor of it, take it off the legislation. Uh, revoke it, and that's what a new Democrat government would do. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Mr. Kent. It seems like at an election time, all these issues come up that haven't been resolved for four years or five years, just depending on how long the government is in here. Now, if it takes 
an election to bring these issues forward. That tells me that the governments, previous governments, time after time, have not addressed these issues and have not, you know, done something to, to make sure that they're not going to be time after time. Uh, our elected MLAs will work sometimes standing alone, sometimes with a coalition, uh, to, to make sure that these issues are brought forward and they're okay. resolved. Thank you, Mr. Kent. And uh, Ms. Crane? Um, I have no further comments. Okay, Mr. Giz? Great. I uh, just wanted to point out uh, that we do work uh, with the unions a lot on this, but like I said, we don't always agree with the issues, and things just can't be solved uh, with a snap of your fingers. And I forgot to mention, I agree with Shannon, the more vacation the better. And as a government, we did not <coughs> introduce Islander Day. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. <laughs> we'll continue with uh, issues affecting workers in our next question. Uh, unionized workers in Prince Edward Island face a number of challenges. We have a two-part question on issues affecting unionized workers and those who are working to form a union in their workplace. Uh, these are both yes-no questions, but you're also welcome to uh, elaborate. Part uh, one of the question, would your government support first contract legislation making it fairer for workers to achieve their first collective agreement after they unionize? And the second part is, where the provincial government does not allow the right to strike by many public employees, Will your government commit to paying the cost of arbitration to resolve collective agreement disputes? And we'll begin this round with Mr. Ryan. Um, we believe that uh, first contract legislation should be in place to prevent the employer from uh, delaying the implementation of a collective agreement. Um, and uh, if it's not there, employers don't have any uh, opportunity of, uh, of taking uh, uh, of, uh, of providing that collective agreement. So uh, we're definitely in favor of uh, first contract legislation. As far as the, uh, it does not allow for strike to, uh, right to strike by uh, public employees. Um, yes, we believe that uh, uh, the cost, the paying the cost of the arbitrator, arbitrator would be in the best interest of uh, the public sector and the uh, taxpayers by coming to the uh, table and, and uh, and coming to a, a mutual agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ken. Um, we also believe that first contract legislation should be implemented. Uh, the right to strike, I believe, is important in, in certain issues. Uh, collective, you know, if, you, if you're not getting something, what else can? What other option do you have? You know, I believe I think that is an option that needs to be looked at if we, if we come into uh, if our MLAs are elected. Thank you. Ms. Green. Um, for question A, first contract legislation, yes. For question B, no. I believe that that's what union dues uh, can be used for. Thank you, Ms. Crane. Mr. Gibbs. Um, I guess for the first question, it's probably, you all know what, I'm not sure. Most likely a no, but it's something that I'm willing to explore and sit down with the unions, talk about it, look at the positive and negatives. I don't have them right in front of me right now. And for the second one, we've gone through this issue and we respectively agree to disagree. Thank you, Mr. Giz and Ms. Lapchuk. Um, for the first question, yes. The second question, I guess I'm on the fence there. <laughs> More information. Uh, on, on, on first glance, I, I think that um, government should pay for the right to strike, uh, or for the, uh, for the cost of the arbitration <laughs> for the uh, employees that uh, don't have the right to strike, but uh, willing to look at um, other, other avenues of paying for it. Would anyone like to take their rebuttal? Those are pretty brief answers. No, because we, we can now move to questions that have come in from... Uh, I wouldn't mind a rebuttal for you. Then we'll give everybody a quick chance, Mr. Ruff. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking that uh, it seems a little unfair that the uh, uh, employer would have the uh, funds from the public purse uh, and the employee uh, would have to uh, have it out of their own pocket uh, as far as... Uh, um, Costs associated to collective bargaining, so uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, unfair for the employer to be uh, uh, holding that over the union in that regard. Anyone else? Going once, going twice, twice. Okay, let's move to uh, questions. He writes the difficulty. Many folks in Prince Edward Island are employed at a minimum wage of 9.30 per hour, going to 9.60 as of October 1st this year. 
That's a hardship for many workers as $9.30 per hour does not provide for the basic necessities for their families. Solution and benefits. What we at the PSAC would like to see is a targeted date of five years, increasing by six month increments, legislating a provincial minimum wage of $17.10 per hour. That is to ask 75 cents from the business communities from now and biannually 10 times for this allowance, achieving the desired outcome in 2016. We feel the Prince Edward Island's increase to a living wage will greatly assist folks to provide the necessities for their families. By having more income in the community, all will benefit businesses as well as individuals. This needs to start with business owners awarding the proposed increase for individuals to be able to contribute back to local businesses by having the means to redistribute their earnings in their local communities. As far as the cost to business, if you do not pay one way, you still have to pay another through social programs and food banks. So it's far better to have people earning a livable wage, contributing to the community, buying goods and services, paying taxes, and feeling good about themselves. There is an opportunity here for PEI to take leadership, uh, take a leadership role and set the example to the rest of Canada. The question, will you commit to raising the minimum wage to $17.10 by October 1st, 2016? And Mr. Kennedy, you're up first. 1710. It's, it's it's a jump, but I think by the time 2016 comes, if you're not making 17 dollars 10 cents an hour, you're in trouble. Uh, and I would look very closely at that. I think it's something that is very feasible. Uh, and it it just uh, I guess if if we have a value added system where uh, businesses, because we will be geared up to fishing and farming and uh, tourism, if there's a value added system, a value added product put in there where an uh, entrepreneur can make more money and more profit, I believe it's very possible to uh, implement that, uh, that trend in the next, by 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. That was great. Thank you. I don't make commitments that I know I can't keep. Uh, in terms of, I think right now, it's important that on the PST, uh, going down from 10% to 9%, uh, and also in, for um, increasing the provincial personal exemption, to right now 7,900. What happens sometimes when you increase the minimum wage, it sounds good, but it actually, if you don't do something with the tax part, uh, you don't get to keep as much money in your pocket. Uh, so I just leave that there. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Gibbs? Um, I like the idea, Vaughn. Um, I wish, I'd like to create an economy where it's going to be, the private sector is going to have to pay $20 an hour on their own. Uh, I don't think it's fair to put a target out there five years down the road. Um, I will say this, that if you look at uh, what we've done over the last number of years, we did come out with a long range view where we gave, I think it was probably a year and a half period and saying here when the increase is gonna be uh, till we get to $10. I think probably what we'll do is try to do that in the future so it is more predictable for the earner and for the employer. Um, I don't think the PST cut is a good idea. If you look at it, we don't pay PST on home heating fuel on electricity, on food, uh, on, on groceries, or on um, clothing. Um, so, you know, you've got those areas uh, where there's no PST now. And believe it or not, a PST cut would probably, I think, if you talk to some economists, benefit the wealthier rather than uh, the people in the uh, lower incomes. Uh, so I don't think that that's a good idea moving from that front. Well, at the same time, I don't want to criticize everybody. I think the idea of moving up the basic personal exemption is a good idea to help out uh, low-income owners. It would be nice if you could do it where you could say if you make over $100,000 a year, your basic personal exemption is going to remain the same. If you make under 50, your basic personal exemption moves up. If I'm going to play around with the tax system, those are the type of things that I like to do. Thank you, Mr. Giz.